Welcome to Complex Issues, a series which highlights recent work, distinguished work, by Columbia faculty, especially School of the Arts faculty. So tonight, our very distinguished writer is Liz Harris, um, and the, the book in question is her just published Jerusalem, Three Generations of an Israeli Family and a Palestinian Family. Um, we're very proud to host a conversation between Liz and another distinguished journalist, Ted Conover. Now, here's how the evening will proceed. Um, Liz will read. Uh, the conversation with Ted will follow. And then will come audience questions. You will play your part. Uh, books, I'm sure some of you noticed, are over there to the left. Close up. Um, and they will be available for purchase uh, after the conversation. And Liz will also be signing. Yes? Yes. All right. So um, Liz Harris was a longtime staff writer for The New Yorker, and she has taught at Columbia in their writing program since 1996. Come this January, she will assume the position of chairman of the writing program. She's the author of three highly acclaimed books of literary nonfiction, Holy Days, The World of a Hasidic Family, Rules of Engagement, Four Couples, and American Marriage, and Tilting at Mills, Green Dreams, Dirty Dealings, and the Corporate Squeeze. That sounds very, very, very hideously timely. The range and the depth of these works, their combination of openness and skepticism, precision and elegance, narrative analysis, profile, and scholarship have made them really celebrated, taught um, works of literary nonfiction. Um, I was going to read a bit from the introduction, but Liz is reading tonight, so I don't need to. Um, Ted Conover, with whom she'll be in conversation, is the Director of Journalism at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute of New York University. His latest book, The Roots of Man, is about roads and their power to change people and places. His previous book, New Jack, Guarding Sing Sing, won the National Book Critics Circle Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His other books are Whiteout, Coyotes, and Rolling Nowhere, Riding the Rails with America's Hobos. Um, I also recommend that you go back to Harper's, the August 2019 issue, to read his densely rendered um, and reported Piece, the Last Frontier, which um, contains the material, the seeds of what will be his next book. Um, in his 2016 book, Immersion, A Writer's Guide to Going Deep, he observes that immersion journalism, which they are both high, high-level practitioners of, it has high potential, huge potential, forgive me, for sowing empathy in the world. And he says that an immersion writer cannot help but come to appreciate the other's point of view, hopefully in a way that is both visceral and nuanced. Unsurprisingly, one of the books he focuses on is Liz Harris's Holy Days. Appropriately, he is in conversation with Liz tonight about her richly immersive in Jerusalem or Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, I was right. All right. Thank you. Um, Liz. Liz Harris. I am proud to introduce her. Thank you, Margo. I'm going to give this back to you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming this, this drizzly evening. Um, I'm going to read f from different sections of the book, not all one section, and the first part of the book that I'll read is from the prologue. 
A starry night in the Judean desert. I'm lying on my back, cocooned in a sleeping bag and staring up at the sky, trying to figure out a way to bring even an atom of the peacefulness of this place back to Jerusalem. It was the first of many long visits over ten years, and Jerusalem was where I'd planted myself. But on this night, an old acquaintance had invited me to join his family and a friend for a short camping trip on one of Israel's phenomenally frequent national holidays. The excursion was an annual tradition for everyone but me, and most of the group, but especially my friend, had slightly romantic feelings about the moonlight desert landscape where we pitched tent, ca camp. Elsewhere in the desert rose the site of the fortress of Masada, the cave in Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, the amazing St. George's Monastery carved into the crevices of the Judean hills, and the large settlement of Mal Adunim. But our rocky campsite was surrounded on all sides by nothing. It looked like a setting for a Beckett play, a cool, stony whiteness with chalky cliffs stretching into treeless, plantless infinity. A wind so strong that my friend's two strapping boys had a difficult, difficult time setting up their crazily flapping tent. Supposedly, the landscape was teeming with life, particularly night creatures. There were rumors of striped hyenas and caracals, wolves, foxes, gazelles, ibexes, and hyraxes, small furry creatures that look a bit like earless rabbits and like the many desert reptiles use the rocks to regulate their body temperatures. But none crossed the rocky, the rocky terraces and escarpments around us. Nor in the deepening twilight did we glimpse a single hawk or buzzard wheeling overhead. Nor, later, any nocturnal bird making its way across the darkening sky. In a certain way, the landscape extended one aspect of Israel's complex persona that seems inescapable. Its hardness. Particularly Jerusalem's, with its hard stone walls, hard stone houses, hard marble floors, and a citizenry conflict-hardened and militarily trained to be tough. For a while, I also tried to imagine the flight of Muhammad, who, according to Islamic tradition, descended upon this quadrant of star-speckled sky to Jerusalem from Mecca and went back on his winged steed Barak and to summon forth the ancient Hebrews, Babylonians, Persians, Hasmoneans, Macedonians, and Romans, who, whatever disputes engaged them, like me, surely gazed up appreciatively. In these imaginings, too, I had limited success. Back in Jerusalem, with its crowded streets, malls, and high-density housing, you are all too aware of the country's smallness. Israel is only slightly larger than New Jersey, the fifth smallest state in the United States. But in the long, open prospect of the desert, you can easily imagine the land as a place of dreams and longing, and, it goes without saying, of contention. At that point, for me, the dimensions of the conflict looked as unencompassable as the horizon. Over the course of the evening, I peppered my companions with questions that reflected how new my encounter with the country was, though many of them had been ratcheting around in my brain for years especially those that turned on the country's rightward drift. My outsiderness stood out nakedly in this conversation, but I hoped I could eventually arrive at a useful perspective. As a secular diaspora Jew raised by parents who weren't particularly political, but to the extent that they were, were liberal, I had an intense desire to understand how the Israelis' history had led the country to where they were. After a while, escaping what must have seemed like a never-ending barrage of questions, my friend's friend bid good night to her teenage daughter who was sitting next to her, turned definitively in her bag, and zipped herself into sleep position. An Israeli developmental psychologist, she had worked along Palestinian colleagues on a project about early childhood for years, she said, and everyone got along fine, and a cordial, even warm relationship prevailed. But in times of violent Israeli-Palestinian hostilities, those relationships turned frigid because no foundation of trust, trust existed, despite their long history together. And nothing ever said at a conference or meeting or expressed in a document had ever changed that. Just before shutting her eyes, she shot me a somewhat pitying look and murmured, wake me when the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is over. 
Uh, this next section um, is about a specific checkpoint, a much dreaded checkpoint of all the many dreaded checkpoints for Palestinians, um, called Kalandia. Uh, and Naveen often has to go through it. Naveen is the main uh, uh, Palestinian person I wrote about in the family. She was in her late 20s at this point, and her full name is Naveen Abu Layl, and it was the Abu Layls I wrote about. Oh, and you'll hear the name Zainab at the end. That's her mom. F four days a week, Naveen works with Arab children who have special needs related to speech, working for an institution in the Israeli Jerusalem school system. Until a few years ago when she quit, she'd also held a similar job in the Arab school system in the West Bank in Ramallah. She made her way there twice a week on Saturday and Sunday, each time dreading the challenge of the Kalandia checkpoint through which she had to pass. Palestinians drive miles out of their way to avoid Kalandia, but Naveen didn't because it was the most convenient way to get from her home to her job if things went well. Sometimes she drove her VW through the checkpoint, sometimes she took a taxi up to it and then went through on foot. On the Israeli side, a big red sign warned that the checkpoint was the entrance to Area A, a zone, the zone run by the Palestinians, and therefore forbidden to Israeli citizens, life-threatening and against Israeli law to enter. It was the return trip, however, that gave Naveen trouble. Coming the other way from the West Bank, for anyone not in a vehicle, there is an elaborate and challenging walkway. Besides being under surveillance, the pedestrian encounters stoplights, a metal barrier, and aggressive and often quite young and jittery Israeli soldiers, too many of whom treat the Palestinian multitudes, as Naveen put it bluntly, like animals, subhumans. The passageway resembles nothing so much as the pre-Temple Grand and cattle conveyor tracks. If you're driving from, through Kalandia from the West Bank into Jerusalem, as Naveen often did, you tend to move fitfully and with excruciating slowness in a long line of cars inching toward the checkpoint and its gaggle of helmeted soldiers holding M16s manning it. Sometimes the traffic moves along steadily, but more often it doesn't. People are challenged. Something is wrong with someone's papers. An hour or more can pass for those waiting in line. The sun is hot, or your air conditioning is too cold. Tempers fray. When you finally reach the checkpoint, you are stopped, your identity papers are checked, and the trunk of your car is scrutinized, not just for bombs, but for a complicated list of prescribed foods, including dairy products that cannot be brought back to the other side. When you are at last wave forward, a mad rush of cars endeavoring to jockey their way to a better lane position ensues. According to the human rights organization Bet Salem, there were two, in 2017 39 staffed military back check barrier checkpoints, of which Kalandia is one, 59 fixed checkpoints in the West Bank, and many so called flying checkpoints, which can pop up anywhere, anytime, often on major transportation routes at rush hour. Since the end of the Second Intifada, there, there has been a diminution of bombings and the Israeli peak of fatalities that were their raison d'etre. Ali Klebo, <clears throat> uh, for the anthropologist and, and, and painter Ali Klebo, the checkpoint experience is a relentless reminder of the occupation. At the checkpoint, nothing moves. Along with the sense of entrapment, the feelings of aggregation and tension escalate. You are stuck going nowhere. Life feels like a traffic jam. You cannot steer your car, and you cannot steer your life. The weekly grimness of Kalandia played such havoc with Naveen's nerves that she eventually decided the Ramallah job wasn't worth it. Her usual route to that job took her from her family's house on French Hill to the Israeli side of the checkpoint and from there to Ramallah on the Palestinian side. It was most convenient for her to drive, but her salary barely paid for the gas. She might have considered holding on to the job, Naveen told me, since like all young professionals, she wanted to beef up her resume. But her demoralizing experiences at the checkpoint had accumulated in her mind enough to convince her to quit. On the day she was scheduled to work in Ramallah, Naveen found herself waking up in the morning and dreading what was ahead. 
one encounter in particular haunted her. It happened during the second intifada. Heading home from the West Bank, she had arrived at the checkpoint just as it was closing, though there were actually five minutes to go before the six o'clock curfew. She hadn't driven that day and was planning to catch a cab ride home on the other side. To Naveen's dismay, the soldiers blocked her from the walkway and refused to let her pass. A sweet-faced young woman, why not relent? But soft compromise has no place here. Iron rules lock the soldiers' responses into predictable channels. Perhaps her abaya was hiding a bomb. She pleaded with them in Hebrew to let her through. Her family, Naveen said, would be really worried if she didn't get home soon. And the, to her, authoritatively coupled words, family and worried, just bounced off the soldiers' helmets. Then the gruffest of the soldiers, using foul language, told her to hurry up and move on. Darkness had already fallen, so she rushed along a temporary fence. This was before the far more impregnable separation barrier was built, hoping to find a hole she could crawl through or to run into someone who could help her get to another checkpoint that might stay open later. In the, open later. In the distance, she saw several silhouettes, <clears throat> and soon a woman and a child emerged, and later a man, nearby. They had obviously run into the same problem. They nodded to one another, but didn't speak. She heard shouting and what sounded like a gunshot not too far away. A light rain began to dampen her clothes. She thought she saw someone in the middle distance. Was it a figure falling to the ground? Had someone been shot? Would she be next? Her heart rattled in her chest. By then it had become so dark that she could barely see where she was going, and the temperature was dropping fast. A while later a car appeared out of nowhere, and the driver offered the little group a ride out of the West Bank for a price. They all hastily agreed and after she'd made it safely through another smaller checkpoint, she ran along the road. Most of the little money she'd had in her wallet had gone to the driver, so a taxi wasn't a possibility, and she had to make her way to the nearest bus stop. When she finally arrived home, her family welcomed her with great relief. They had been worried. There was so much violence in that period, Zainab told me, so many mass arrests, and so much use of administrative detention that every Palestinian family worried when their children walked out the door. Um, then this next section is about the, the family, Yaron Ezraki, the main Israeli man in the family that I wrote about, who very, very sad to say, died two weeks after I handed in the book and never got to see this. And he was enormously helpful and a wonderful man. The walk to Ruth and her husband Yaron's house from my short-term rental studio in Jerusalem's leafy German colony, named after the evangelical German Templars who settled there in the mid-19th century, takes about 10 minutes. Along the way, I pass streets named after Gentiles considered good for the Jews, Lloyd George for one and Emil Zola for another. A phalanx of kosher restaurants that cater to the ever-burgeoning number of the religious who have moved into the neighborhood and edged out many mom-and-pop stores, and a small, popular supermarket where I often shop. From my very first visit to the market, I was amused and annoyed in equal measure by a singular aspect of the place. Despite its extremely narrow aisles and general crowdedness, almost nobody makes room for you when you need to pass through. Even after you say, Shlicha, which means excuse me, um, even after you politely repeat it, no movement, nothing. At first I thought it was a fluke of that day, but I soon came to realize that no, it was the Israeli way. There didn't appear to be any aggression in it. People more or less magnetized into a comfortable clump and saw no reason to budge. Recently I saw a photograph of an, an Israeli dance troupe performing, and there they were in a graceful cluster, as if glued together. It was, as Yaron puts it in his lucid and most straightforwardly topical book, Rubber Bullets, Power and Conscience in Modern Israel, a pattern of interaction that derives from the lack of a Western sense of an impermeable, invisible circle that protected the private space of each individual. Reading that passage, I thought of rush hour in the New York subway and what I've always regarded as the incredible forbearance of most of its long-suffering passengers packed into 
the cars, who nonetheless, even there, sensitive to the concept of private space, are forever apologizing for sticking an elbow in your ear or a backpack in your face. On the one hand, Yarun attributed this national phenomenon in part to the closer proximity of people living in the Middle East. On the other, it's a component of his larger portrait of his culture's preoccupation with collective liberation and cultural revival. Once, he writes, I found myself telling my students at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem that there's a very curious social phenomenon called a queue in which people spontaneously line up, standing one after another in a line without touching or shouting. For example, in bus stations or banks, students who wanted to observe or study such curious behavior, I said without, with only slight exaggeration, would have to travel abroad. On a more serious level, in Rubber Bullets and in much of his writing, Yaron provides a persuasive analysis of his country's ongoing conflict between the collectivist nature, national ethos that created and perpetuates the state and its capacity to embody the principles of a global democracy. He points out the ways the historical, the historical need to fight a war of survival to justify the ultimate sacrifice of lives and later to cope with terror, coupled with a delayed reaction to the Holocaust, reinforced the tendency to idealize state power. But he also shows how that history badly weakened Israel's ability to nourish liberal democratic principles. Yaron and I first met at a low-key neighborhood cafe not far from his house. Like all Israeli men, he was dressed in a relaxed way, a short sleeve shirt and khakis, no tie, no jacket, the ubiquitous male national costume even in the Knesset. The top of his head was hidden that afternoon beneath a straw fedora, a precaution against the penetrating Mediterranean sun, which he and Ruth were leery of since both had struggled with bouts of cancer. The hat hid the fact that like the, an amazing preponderance of his countrymen, he was balding. Some 30% of Israeli men experience balding by the time they are 30, and 70% will lose more than half their hair by the time they reach 60. By then I had learned that the headgear of the men sitting around us at nearby tables provided clues to their identities. Normal-sized kippahs or yarmulkes meant religious. Colorful knitted ones indicated settlers or modern Orthodox Jews, mostly American. Minute kippahs, each precariously secured with a metal barrette, meant religious but not necessarily enthusiastically so, often worn by young men. Not seated at the cafe, not kosher enough, but peppily bounding by in the broiling midday sun were black-garbed men wearing the strimals or heavy fur hats of married Hasidic men. But Yarun's hat was just a hat. The clothing of the women was more varied, but there was a recognizable religious woman costume consisting of a long tunic or blouse over slacks over a long skirt and some kind of headgear, often in the form of what in my mother's generation was called a snood, an outfit I came to think of incorrectly as kibbutz girl. Yaron, who was born in 1940, grew up in Tel Aviv in an artistic milieu that acted as a strong countervalent to the countercurrent to the prevailing cultural winds. The era of utopian Zionism still powerfully influenced his family, but universalist, humanistic, modern values were his daily nourishment. Yaron came of age in an Israel that ignored serious injuries to the native population, but compared to today, it was a less racist, fairly moderate society that still bore some resemblance to European social democracies. But whatever forces shaped him, the man who emerged radiated intellectual confidence the way great athletes radiate superb fitness. Yaron credits his father with giving him an extraordinary sense of the largeness of the world and the beauty of art and music. His father, who died in 2003 at 99, was a violinist and composer who served as one of the directors of Israel's first music conservatory and spoke eight languages, including Arabic. His playing, Yaron writes in Rubber Bullets, opened up gates to the self, which I could appreciate only years later. And finally, I'm going to read, uh, actually, for the uh, very end of the book. I have, in, in the marked in gray in the book, 
uh, sections in which uh, they're not about either family, but about my various journeys with my who my driver Fuad, whose last name I changed in the book, and who became my friend and my husband's friend, and I grew to truly love. And even now that I'm all finished with the book, we're on the phone frequently. And um, Fuad is a wonderful man. Uh, the section is this, all the sections are called Travels with Fuad. This is Travels with Fuad 5. From time to time, after a long day, Fuad and I drove to the Palestinian Christian West Bank ta town of Bayajala, about eight miles south of Jerusalem and a stone's throw from Bethlehem, to the Chicken Man, as we had both come to refer to our destination. These outings were rare, since most of the time both of us were busy working. Sometimes my husband joined us, and sometimes it was just Fuad and me. So, Fuad had taken his family there m many times, too. As soon as we were seated, the sons of the Kaab, our family, who run the small restaurant, placed before us delicious grilled chicken, along with five or six generously filled plates of meze. And inevitably, one of us remarked on the undisputed superior, uh, superiority of the Kaab's chicken to all others. The chicken man himself, the elder Kabar, raises his own birds, and his customers travel great distances to eat at his pocket-side establishment, which is perched on a steep hill in an enclave of town with few parking spaces. The grill itself, which sits just outside the restaurant, is large and looks like it was assembled from auto parts. Sometimes after we've eaten, we drive into Bethlehem to peer in silence at the depressing graffiti-covered wall that encircles the city and looms in a particularly ugly way over homes and businesses. Some of the graffiti was contributed by the British artist Banksy, including an image of a girl being carried over the wall by balloons. More recently, in July 2017, the Australian street artist Lush Sucks painted the image of Donald Trump, Trump touching, touching the wall, clearly based on the widely circulated photo of the U.S. president at the Western Wall the previous May with a thought bubble next to his head. Quote, I'm going to build you a brother. <laughs> a um, sometimes after, oh, sorry. A lively woman I met a few years back, the Palestinian-American art curator Salwa Mikdadi, had been stuck in Bethlehem overnight the week before we met. The military had declared one of its intermittent curfews, and the friend she was visiting, who had serious heart problems and badly needed some medicine she'd run out of, was prevented from passing through the wall exit to get to her pharmacy. The friend had survived the experience, but the sheer stupidity of the incident still made McDotty's blood boil. McDotty divided her time between Berkeley, California, and Jerusalem, and I suspected that her en garde chafing, so different from the spirit of silent endurance I often encountered in Jerusalem, probably arose from her American side. McDotty told me she was heartened by some young people she talked with who had fresh ideas about challenging the, challenging the, sorry, about changing the political situation, but in general, everything looked practically hopeless to her. How can you make a nation out of this? It's like a big refugee camp. The West Bank should not be called the West Bank. It's a refugee camp, the largest Palestinian refugee camp. When I discovered the extraordinary poems of Taha Muhammad Ali, I began asking Fuad, whenever we found ourselves in Bethlehem, to indulge me by driving slowly down the street on which I believed the poet ran a souvenir shop, though I don't, didn't know which one. In fact, his souvenir shop was in Nazareth, but I didn't learn that for many years. From many photographs I'd seen of Ali's long, expressive face, I did know exactly what he looked like, and one day I hoped and believed I would spot him. What I'd do next if that happened, I had no idea, but it hadn't by 2011 when the poet died. Passing well beyond stalking range. Of all the words poured over the wounds of the conflict, his seemed the truest and the most enduring. The day I heard of his death, I took refuge in his plain-spoken, powerful death poem, Twigs, which ends, After we die, and the weary heart has lowered its final eyelid on all that we've done, and all that we've longed for, and all that we've dreamt of, all we've desired or felt, hate 
will be the first thing to putrefy within us. Thank you. And now my friend and colleague, Ted Conover, and I are going to chat about this. Um, it was such a pleasure to hear you read from the book. Thank you. I have been hearing your voice as I read it, but to, um, to hear your actual voice is um, another thing and a, a true pleasure. And I liked your selections because it reflected the combination of uh, first-person reportage and, and witnessing alongside history, um, alongside books. You spent a lot of time reading uh, books by Palestinian and um, Israeli authors and many others, uh, especially about history. And then there was also your trademark humor alongside more solemn and um, uh, quiet moments. So all of this is in the book. It's a... Uh, a different book, obviously, from Holy Days. That's how I found you. I uh, came to New York, wondered about these uh, strangely dressed people um, called Hasidim, I learned. Um, my wife's uh, then-girlfriend, now wife, suggested I read Holy Days, and um, I loved it. And after I started teaching, I... Um, thought maybe Liz Harris would visit me if I assigned her book to my class, and she uh, kindly did, and we've <clears throat> developed a reciprocal thing over the years. Anyway, I'm thrilled to be here, and thank you for I'm inviting so pleased me. you are, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, here's a, here's a question. I imagine <clears throat> everyone in the audience will, will know something about... Um, uh, at the start of Holy Days, you describe where you're coming from as a writer um, and as a Jewish person. You write that today's secular Jews find the existence of Hasidim mildly embarrassing, uh, and that includes the reactions of your um, your parents. You describe finding a stack of family photos that included one of a fierce-looking bearded old man wearing the sort of fur hat and long black coat that Hasidic men wear. When I asked my mother, a Manhattan-bred lawyer, who he was, she peered at the photograph briefly and disapprovingly and shrugged, nobody in our family. Um, right. <laughs> but because you are a thinking person, you um, thought maybe your mom was wrong. Our progenitors came from Austria, Romania, and Russia, and in the 19th century, three-quarters of the Jewish population of Eastern Europe was Hasidic. You describe your family's attitude toward their Jewishness as, quote, more or less that of fans whose home team was the Jews, which I've always loved. Um, but whenever I think a person today comes to a new book or a uh, a uh, movie or television series about the Middle East, we wonder where is this person coming from? Um, my wife and I just watched um, Our Boys on HBO. I don't know how many have seen this series, but it's... Uh, wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, it's about the murder of three Israeli boys by Hamas militants, or it follows the murder of those boys in the summer of 2017. Uh, the murder was followed by the murder of a Palestinian boy, and it's about an Israeli intelligence officer's efforts to get to the bottom of it. And, and about the milieu of the country it, that allows that, or, exactly. or, or where it happens. So it it's, um, turns out the series is complicated. It's not coming from one place, and I like uh, that this event is part of a series called Complex Issues, because... Um, Likewise, what you do, are talking about here is very complicated. How would you describe your position as a, um, as a writer coming to this? Where are you coming from? Well, as I, in what I read today, I said that my family, they weren't very political, but they were liberal. And um, all the things that I'd heard over the last years were about the rightward drift of the, of, of the government. There was a concerted effort to make a new person out of 
Eastern European Jews to make the new country because they were having a, to lead a life very different from, from the city lives that they'd mostly or a lot led. Um, I really, no matter what I'd read, I, I, I couldn't understand how that transformation had been accomplished and what was behind it and what were the ideas behind it. I think I'm always interested in, um, I, but people call this bottom-up history, mm -hmm. Um, the larger ideas, what they are, and how they actually affect people's everyday lives. I'd read the books about what the policies were, but I still didn't really grasp what it meant to be a, an Israeli person living through that, or or a Palestinian. And uh, it was a I mean, it's a question of all of my books. Seem, I seem to start with no, out with knowing very little. Our great editor at the New Yorker more or less gave us the idea that we could write about anything. Sure, brain surgery, I can do that. Um, but you know, um, if you if you work hard enough and read enough history and learn about it, um, I am not a political scientist. I am not an expert in this, but I I think I put enough in the book so that someone like me who could read it would have a better sense of what the situation was, at least I hope so. Yes, I, um, well I'd say you succeeded. This is a, a lesson in the history of Israel as experienced by these two extended families. If you aren't an expert in the history of Israel, you might almost be at the end of the book, I think, uh, because the main events of uh, that history, including its establishment and um, the, the uh, wars and the intifada, it, these are all milestones in the lives of the families, which brings us to the idea of a family as a as an, uh, sort of narrative unit, as a way to tell a history. And uh, I bet... Um, I, well, I for one would like to know how you uh, settled on these two families. You you readily admit they're not necessarily representative. There's no such thing. Well, part of it is who would have me. I mean, that's that's. Would you like me in your life for ten years, hanging around all the time, asking you questions? No. Would I like anyone like me in my life? No, I wouldn't. So partly. People have an interest of some kind to be able to do it. Um, I have to say, Ted knows this, but um, the family that I write about here was not the original family that I was writing about. The original family that I wrote about for actually and researched for three and a half years. I write about it in the book. They had an ugly divorce. The Palestinian family. The Palestinian family. family, right. And the whole story became sort of a telenovela, which was not the book that I was writing. And I, I, I just withdrew. They thought I could just go on. And as someone said, it probably would sell more books. But that's another question altogether. Um, so um, the interest of the Palestinian family was that they thought they were misrepresented too much in the ordinary Western press. And the interest of the uh, Israeli family was they thought there were so many complexities of the situation that people didn't understand and they were also misrepre misrepresented in the press and often in history books. So they both had their own interest in putting up with me and God bless them because I was there a lot. Well, I imagine that when you met them you did not uh, spin out the next 10 years of uh, their time that you would need. You, but no. you were able to at least um, win their confidence to begin a conversation with you. That's right. Did you make any mistakes along the way? I'll tell you a mistake I made when the Israeli Defense Forces agreed to let me hang out with some soldiers north of Ramallah. I was speaking to my press minder one day, first trip to Israel or the West Bank, and somehow in the conversation, I ended up saying uh, Zionist project, which uh, I thought was just something people could say. Zionism, you could say that, but it, they immediately looked at each other like, uh, who is this guy and where's he coming from? You were saying that instead of Israel. You I mean. guess I said it instead of Israel. I don't quite remember. I just knew that I'd made a mistake. Um, yes. Um, you know, uh, I was so ignorant when I began. Um, I think they just put up with that for a long time and, you know, treated me like an idiot who would get to be smarter as she went along. Um, uh, 
Well, there were some th things you could call mistakes, but I didn't, I mean, for example, a lot of people wanted me to wear a hijab when I went to Muslim society, and i a very stubborn person, I, I won't do that. Fuad thought you'd look very good in he a hijab. He thought I'd look cute in yeah, a hijab, that's right, basically. That's, right, that's, that's right. another story. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was his way of welcoming me into his circle in a certain way. But I would never. But it never seemed to harm me, you know. But so, I, I, I'm sure I made many mistakes. Um, uh, you know, I put right. my foot in my mouth many, many times. But I so many times that I can't remember one, one specific one. But but you recovered. People. Yes. People looked at the larger experience yes. of knowing you and uh, yes. what you were asking about. Yes, and yes. Uh, very often when I talked to people whose politics were very far to the right and I would say something like you that seemed to me ordinary and they would take umbrage at it. You know, right. They didn't like me using, the, some people didn't like me using uh, the term uh, West Bank. They wanted me to say Judea and exactly. Samaria, exactly. for example. No, it's a minefield of yeah. some of the language. Um, uh, the people you meet in both families seem thoughtful, reasonable, relatable. There are no uh, bomb-throwing extremists that I oh, met. Oh, there, there was. Which one? Well, the, the, I mean, the whole chapter on Aunt Ra Razmia. Okay. She was tortured yeah. and in jail for 10 years. That right. would qualify. But I, but I mean... The people we get to know through you are mm -hmm. not, um, uh, they don't, uh, I don't think so. I don't think anybody struck me as uh, a crazy extremist. Well, the Israelis thought she was and put her in jail for a decade and they did torture her. So they can, but but she wasn't, she, she made a, an appearance very late in my research. Right. And, and the ones who were more even, forget extreme, the ones who were even more passionate wouldn't talk to me. So they don't appear on okay, the scene. Okay, that, that was my I, I question. I mentioned Ahmad. Yeah. Ahmad was the oldest boy in the family. I met him by accident once, but then he wouldn't ever meet with me again. He told me to call him. I called him perhaps a thousand and one times, and he never got back to me. But, okay. Because he just thought I wouldn't understand his position, which I would have. In the month I spent there, I met extremists on both sides who um, were very hard to spend time with because mm -hmm. they, uh, what they said felt very toxic and mm -hmm. uh, was just hard to listen to in an empathetic fashion. And um, I did interview the Hamas guys. I know, I know. Uh, but they were elder statesmen of Hamas, so they were different no, they were politicians sort of They too. were politicians, that's right. Um, uh, you also are quite willing to go into the history of each family so far as they recall it and also so far as they can take you there. So you went to um, the formerly vibrant town of Lifta, is that how you say yes, it? Yes, it is. Uh, and that was uh, quite moving uh, because Naveen uh, took you along with an elderly neighbor yes. of hers. Yes, And they're visiting a place they had to leave. Right? Yes. And above them is a uh, settler's uh, highway yes. that has changed everything. It's on, on page 74. Uh, wow. You have to come with me to all my readings. <laughs> um, yeah. There was something I wanted to say about it. it just how it's living history yes. for them. Yeah, well, for example, there's the settler boys yes, playing near the old well. That's right. right. Um, so, yeah, th that, uh, the afternoon we were there, Naveen watched uh, in silence as a group of Orthodox boys played near the village's famous spring. I mean, it's the village her family had been in for hundreds of years. Um, it's impossible to wander today, wander today through the steeply ter terraced village with its vestiges of old taboons, cross vault, arched passageways, courtyards, and ghostly crumbling houses, and not think about the lives lived in the place. This was not a lost and then centuries later found world. 
world like Herculaneum or Pompeii or a monument to past glory like the Acropolis or kitsch living history like colonial Williamsburg. It is a history of an unhealed wound, a past that for exiles and non-exiles alike has not lost its presentness and occupies a mental space fired by longing and fantasy. Above all, like so much in Israel, it is a history that remains contested. That, that's exactly what I was thinking of, that yes, passage. Yes, but she isn't sentimental about it. She does not wear a key around. You've heard of people, mm -hmm. Palestinians, wearing keys around. She does not. She, this, this hurts her, and she doesn't like to think about it, and she's received her family's idea of it, but that's not what her life is revolves around in right. any way, really. Right. Um, so, the uh, recent party in your honor, I was in the room... Um, with a number of uh, celebrated writers, um, uh, some of whom fell into a kind of competition about whose book had taken the longest to complete. <laughs> this is um, this is the sort of conversation that's probably a nightmare to publishers. But uh, there really was some one-upmanship um, between William Finnegan, uh, whose surfing memoir took more than 10 years to write. Adrian Nicola Blanc, who's 15. 15. Who weighs in at uh, 15. Jason DeParl, whose new book about uh, uh, the Philippines and people he's known there, he said he's been researching 27 years. Well, I think he's the winner. <laughs> <laughs> or the loser. Which, which yeah. is it? Do you, um, do you take pride in the... Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, my Hasidic family thought I would never publish the book and were surprised when I did. And that was only a five-year. I mean, that was nothing. Um, no, I, you know, I teach full-time, as you know. <laughs> And then I lost the family. Right. Also, they were there, and I, I am here. Um, and also, it just was really, I mean, I talk fast, and I think fast, but I write very slowly, actually. Mm. And I had, it took me a while to think of what this critter was going to be, right. you know. Whereas with the Hasidic family, it was much easier, because I, I was like an urban anthropologist, in a way. I just, I didn't know about any of this stuff, and it was, you know. And also, there was not blood spilling, Right. You know, the this is a soft war or a hard war. You're you're in a war zone one way or another and that's a very different kind of responsibility. I felt between your um book learning, all the knowledge you got from the good books you read and you credit many historians uh for helping with that and then your first hand reporting, you just had an immense amount of information to synthesize. That's true. Um What's wonderful about the book is that um, Liz will be in the middle of something that's kind of involved and Solomon probably moving, like uh, Esther adjusting to a non-religious education, and we come upon this sentence, Goethe Schmerta. <laughs> Or um, right. Khaled describing his sister's life in London and her longing to come back to family in Jerusalem. And here's a quote. It was difficult for me, this is Liz speaking, to imagine that a Palestinian woman with a good life in a city with less conflict would willingly come back to the stresses and anxieties of Jerusalem. And I'm sure I looked incredulous as I blurted out, really? She'd leave <laughs> London for this? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's quite... a appealing that you um, would share uh, that very gut-level reaction. It's partly why I have the Fuad sections. Our mutual friend Ann Fadiman says they're like palate cleansers in the book because a lot of it is, there are jokes. Right. Fuad and I kidded around a yeah. lot. But it's also very serious. He was stopped, uh, scarily stopped while I was in the car by a policeman who was taunting him and trying to get him to, you know, get angry and do something he'd regret. No, that stuff, is, that's terrifying. It is and, terrifying. And you uh, feel it because you're just sitting uh, exactly. watching. Exactly. And Fuad gave us a look which said, don't, don't interfere with this. I know how to handle this and you don't, which would be right because as an American, I, I'd go up and huffily confront yeah. him. That would have done exactly nothing or worse. Right. Uh, you describe being um, brought by Fuad to a bridal party for his sister-in-law. And um, uh, you say, 
you like to dance, but this wasn't your kind of dancing. Yet they, belly dancing. Ah, uh, belly dancing. But they brought you over into the midst of it. Um, the children found my efforts hilarious, and I observed with stoic resignation that my antics were being recorded on a video camera, doubtless to be replayed on some gloomy winter evening for those very same children as an alternative to an animated cartoon. <laughs> so um, I admire you for getting out there. And um, I think I also said in that section that the you know, th this kind of dancing was was showed the limits of we are all one big familyism <laughs> <laughs> because right. I I could that the oldest old lady and the youngest little girl could do this dancing and I really could could not. <laughs> so I love to dance. <laughs> um, the so w I I feel that a writer who can uh, be funny and graceful in the midst of something of deep gravity and, and solemnity has, um, has a great gift. And, and, uh, and you share that all along the way. There's little moments of surprise where you, uh, you just say something that uh, no historian would say. Oh, thank you. The two things that I worried about were, were sort of different. Um, well, first of all, I tell my students all the time to worry about research rapture where you get into your subject so deeply that you think every little thing is interesting and your poor reader is left to drift in your focus on this interesting subject that they can't go along with you on. Um, so I, even though I, there's a lot of you know, heavy lifting there in terms of factual material, I hope I didn't, I hope not to bore people. Um, also, there's a certain thing which I, when kind of liberal people write about suffering people, and there are a lot of subjects like that, there's a thing that I call exhibitionistic empathy, mm -hmm. which always gives me the willies when I read it, and I hope not to be doing that. And I was very aware of that. I wanted, to, I am empathetic to the situation, but I, I you not don't want to wear it on your sleeve. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say, aren't I wonderful to feel so much? Mm -hmm. it's, I think there's a lot of texts that are like that, and mm -hmm. they're irritating. Okay. Yeah. Um, were you, so my students who study journalism are growing up in a world where anything they publish is subject to commentary, instantaneous commentary, much of it negative online. It's sort of a horrible fact of, babies. of uh, publishing these days, and it can be quite daunting. And um, uh, you and I are now publishing in the same world, and you chose to take on the subject where, even if you're incredibly fair and uh, even-handed, you're going to attract uh, people who who don't think so. Does that does that slow you down? There must be something wrong with me. <laughs> no, I mean I I do worry. I like count the ways. I I can tell you a trillion things that I worry about this, and I, it worries me, but. It's the job in front of me. That's mm. how I think. I'm, I'm sure you're the same way. You know, people say, oh, you were so brave. or this. That's not how I think about it. I just, you know, I, the subject takes over in mm -hmm. a way, and you're wherever, whatever your worries are, and they're there. I mean, I was very worried in Hebron when the, uh, we were passing down the street with two friends of ours, my husband and I, and a, 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 what, a man in a black hat and a coat on a roof nearby pointed oh, a rifle at yeah. us. And even when we changed direction... Uh, he he turned on the roof and kept the rifle pointed. I have no idea why. Yeah, I was in Hebron at night, and a, a red circle appeared on my shirt. <gasps> and it's Whoa. terrifying. It is it's terrifying. terrifying. It is terrifying. Is it Did a you kid see with the a laser? Person? Is it a kid with a laser, or is it a person with a rifle? You didn't I, see the person. No. See, we saw the person. Mm. And uh, we, we thought, because we were walking actually down a, a, a Palestinian street. Yeah. I mean, I, we we were, you know, we couldn't think of why, you know. That's a very scary city. Uh, Where horrible it, it things has are the, always happening, yes. Right, and it has the core of settlers, just a hundred or two? 200. 200. 200. Surrounded by military. Yes, yeah, surrounded by many thousands of, of Palestinians. And and especially by Palestinians, yeah. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a place where there are a lot of violence, including the horrible massacre that took place this place years ago by Goldstein, yeah. Right, right. Um... Uh, Hmm. Uh, are you done with this subject now? 
Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, all the subjects you have ever written about don't ever leave you. They're rattling around your head, but yes. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. This is this this was an inc- you know. It was more than ten years. It was more than ten years in a way, but really ten years directed. But um, I mean, I could have ten years, but I, the truth is, a book like this, there's always something complex happening there. There is today, there was last week, there will be two weeks from now. So in a way, I could continue to write this book for the rest of my life. That's not practical. Mm -hmm. And, (laughs) um, but I am, you know, I'm in touch with all the people in the book all the time. Not all the time, but from time to time. And I'm will always be interested in the subject. I'm sort of despairing about it. You know, I don't I don't think the end is in sight in any way, especially with the current milieu of our government. I mean, we won't get into it too much, but we we do we do support the country with 3 billion dollars every year, no questions asked. Mm-hmm. Right. Um are you ready to take questions? Absolutely. Okay. Um if there are any, uh, the staff here has cordless microphones like ours and um, ask that you hold one uh, when you ask your question. And um, uh, would you like to be the one who calls on people? Oh, sure. Okay. So I don't see any. Is one, there a hand? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Georgette. Uh, hi. Liz, can you tell us a little bit about the process of combining the research of living with a family and conducting interviews and how you cataloged that at the time that you were doing it and also combining that with the research that you were doing with books? Like, how did that work? (laughs) You have an hour? Um, (laughs) is, Is Jasmine here somewhere? Where's Jasmine? Right up there. Yeah. She, you should ask her. She was my fact checker, and she did such a wonderful job. Um, you know, my research process is extremely impractical. I have friends who do similar kinds of books, and they kind of get the matrix of what they're going to do, and then they categorize it, and then they write the book based on the system that they have. My method is excruciatingly impractical. I just learn as much as I possibly can, and I don't know when I start out what's going to be important, but I want to feel sort of like a sponge that I can press at any point and out will come the material that I need. (laughs) And only slowly does it come to me what that is. I I really, I, 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 I don't know what I think in a deep way until I write. So I, there's a lot of trial and error in the process. It's not a, it's not a, I can't, I, I wish I could lay out for you a process that seems like that I do that, then I do that. Um, it's cumulative. I, I reach a point to which I think I know all I'm going to know to do what I have to do. And there's a lot I'm leaving out and I just have to put that to the side. And then I proceed one step at a time. I, I can't do much better than that. I, th- those are simultaneous things that you're describing. Talking to people, researching, reading, they're all happening together. And uh, there's no game p- plan. Sorry. <laughs> yes, Honor. How would you, oh, wait, wait for the microphone. Oh, sorry. There we go. Here she comes. Mm-hmm. How did you decide how to structure the book? Well, you know... There's the modernist way, which wasn't going to work in this book. Uh, Chronology can be your friend, and that's how I decided to structure it. The oldest people and their experience, the middle generation and their experience, the young people and their experience. I kind of followed that along. Because the subject went off in so many directions at once that unless I had sort of a straightforward matrix or armature for that, I thought I would just go mad, basically. So that that's how I decided, I, and that I kind of knew from that I knew from the beginning, because of the, you know the three generation idea. It wouldn't make sense to do it any other way to put the first generation before the third generation, either the second or whatever. Mm. Yes, sir. Here comes a mic. Uh, did you make any attempt to bring the the two families together socially? 
And in what language was all? Was all everything in English or? It either was in English or uh, somebody translated for me. I'm not an official translator, but there was always a family member or a friend or somebody around to help me out. What was the first part of that question? Sorry. Did you bring the family? Oh, no. People always ask. That's the TV show. However, however, the... Israeli woman who wrote me a lovely note about the book, God bless her, I was so nervous about that, um, said she'd like to meet the people. But it was, you know, that's a different kind of a story. It's like the filmic version in a certain way you're talking about. But she, w they, they probably will meet because they're interested, or at least she's interested. Um, the postal sy system in, in East Jerusalem <clears throat> and the West Bank is horrible. So the book was sent a long time ago. It has not arrived in there at their post office yet. I hope it will arrive. Usually when I have to get something to anybody Palestinian, I do it through an Israeli friend who will meet that person in a cafe and hand it over because the, the postal system is just, I don't know, it's completely surreal, really. Hmm. Yes, more questions? Yes, Suki. <laughs> said initially, I think you said this before, or you read it, uh, in your prologue that you described these people who worked together, mm -hmm. had intimacy, had common goals, and then when hostilities broke out, it just all became mm -hmm. ice. And I remember from way back, in a certain way, it was trying to get to the bottom of that. You mentioned there being no foundation of trust. That's right. So. Ten years later, did you get there? Well, understanding that. Why there's no foundation of trust? Or just what it is. What, I'm sorry, what, what is? Well, that was what drove you to, I thought, I understood that, is to just get into the complexity of that. Well, you know, there's a metronomic violence and war happening there all the time. Right. And there's a lot of hypocrisy. And there's a lot of, you know, I mean, in terms of ordinary human rights, you know, the Palestinians don't have freedom of movement. They, they're, the housing situation is a nightmare. The settlers' papers always trump whatever papers they have in terms of real estate. I mean, the list is endless. This family, the Israeli family that I wrote about, is they're activist people. And there's a whole range from deeply religious to completely secular in the family, and they're all protesters, and the protesters don't put a dent into the governmental practices. As I said when we were talking earlier, um, I was very smug when I was writing this book about how our country and how some of these things could never happen in our country. And I've been quite chastened since I stopped researching it in a way. But um, it's hard. I mean, there are people, I mean, I have friends who are Israeli and friends who are Palestinian, but I'm out of the culture. And there are people there who have friends. They, there are people who do that, but they're very rare. Because, as Simone Weil wrote about, when someone is represented as a non-human, they both, both sides refer to the other, to Israelis and Palestinians as the other side. It's a scary phrase, the other side. You know, and w once that mindset is there, however deeply, it's hard to get beyond it. And the politicians certainly don't, you know, fan the pl flames of friendship in any way. Yes. Hi. Um, I was just curious if there was a goal you had in mind in setting out to write this story and if that goal had changed from initially before you wrote to after writing it, if there was a message. Uh, um, you know, I'm a writer so I can understand things better. And language is very important to me. And this was just a subject that I was at sea about, and I really wanted to understand it. Um, you know, I do a lot of reporting. I'm not exactly a journalist. I mean, I tell my students to, you know, to write in prose, but to think in poetry because of the range of that in a certain way in their minds. Um, really, I wanted to understand a situation and provide a, a, a version of it in its complexity to the readers. I guess that, that's my, to the extent I had a goal, I think that's the best I can 
do with that. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'll just speak really loudly. So, Liz, were there moments um, when you uh, supplanted, uh, used your imagination to paint a more vivid picture um, of of someone's story, like uh, a light rain dampening someone's clothes? And All the time. Yeah. I mean, sure. Imagination is not, you know, doesn't have a, you know forbidden sign in my brain because I report. No, are, you, are you referring to invention? <laughs> That's included in the question, yeah. Was it raining when you said it? there was a light rain? I oh, assume oh a lie? You mean lie. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, no. Listen, I was raised at the New Yorker. Truth, you know, no. Fealty to truth. Department I mean, of fact. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, why lie when life is so interesting just the way it is? No. I'm shocked, <laughs> shocked to hear that. <laughs> you know, style is language. I mean, but, I, but, but to the extent that it's uh, always about something actual, there it is. But do I enlarge it? Of course I do. I mean, you know, yes, I do. <laughs> D do you enlarge it how? Well, I mean, think of how the reader would take it in more strongly l right. from the language I employ. Right. I mean, that's writing. Right. It's hard to yes. self-analyze that I, really, no, in a way. I do. Um, but I also want to make sure no one thinks you were saying uh, you were sleeping on the desert when, in fact, you were sleeping in a backyard. Never. Exactly. Thank Never. you. Never. Thank you. I'm shocked. shocked I, I'm, to I it. know. I just <laughs> wanted to be really clear about that. There are ways you can tell a story that you imagine will affect somebody uh, that are in, ex entirely factual. Uh, and then there are ways you can show, you can tell, you make all kinds of choices. I, 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 the phrase literary nonfiction is a, mm. is a lovely one because it does separate it from ordinary. I mean, my brother was a correspondent for the New York Times. I could no longer do what he did mm. than I could, I don't know, you know, swim the Nile. He, you know, would go out in the morning, <laughs> report on a story, f file it at five, done. Mm. You know, at five o'clock the same day I've gone somewhere, I'm beginning to think about who it was I was talking to and think about what they were saying. And, and you know, it takes a long time to assimilate stuff. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it is hard. <laughs> it is hard. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So I would imagine that when the family went through the divorce, it may have been easy to say, I'm this is, I, I'm done, you know, how am I going to go on past this? Did, did you have those feelings? Or were there... Easy? God, no, it was hard. No, did you, you mean, did yeah, she... Did you, did you think, I, this is as far as I can go, I'm giving up? Or was there another time when you were writing that you thought, oh, I don't think I can continue with oh, this? So many, tell me about one of those. Yeah, well, that one, that one, many people said, oh, you're done, right? You've lost three and a half years, you're done. I'm very stubborn. I was not done. You know, it was very hard to replace that family. I mean, that that's sort of the nuts and bolts of what I, about that. But it was after the second Gaza war, uh, in which 2,000 and more people, many of them very young children, had been killed, and the Palestinians felt the Western nations hadn't noticed enough or cared enough about it. And just even an American and a Jew uh, entering, asking for help was unwelcome and even when the older generations wanted to do it in a family I had some lovely people who were willing to do it uh, the young people rightly were worried about getting into trouble with the Israeli authorities if they spoke too frankly and that would have been a real problem it took me I, I write about this in the book actually it took me a very long time to find a new family and I was very disheartened many times and I thought that the book would actually die on the vine because of that and, and when I was initially told about this family, <laughs> because they were very religious members, I thought, oh, here I go again, writing about very religious people. And I kind of was shy about that. I, I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. But this family was extraordinarily wonderful to write about because there were so many different points of view that they represented. Yes. So I just have to ask you, following up on that gentleman's question, are you stubborn or are you persistent? 
I think that's such a valiant quality to be persistent, and I think you just undersold yourself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi, Liz. I can't. Uh, oh, hi. I'm Carol. Hi. I see that. I, I'm so near sighted. Um, I can't see anybody. I'm just curious. Like, it's been so amazing. I mean, uh, all the years I've been here, you've been working on this book, and. I think tenacity really is a quality. I'm, I'm curious now, I mean, there's no more volatile subject in New York, I don't think, or this is one of the most volatile, for sure, among um, Israelis, among Jews, among Palestinians. And I'm curious if what you anticipated for the reception and what you've, what you've gotten as the reception and what has surprised you or disappointed you or in good ways surprised you, what, what, anything about that. Um, thank you. Well, so far all the reviews have been l lovely, mm -hmm. but as you know, because I think I told you about this, I straight out of the gate, I did an event at Yale, I, I did a day event and a night event, and the night event was co-sponsored by uh, something called the Slitka Center, run by the Jewish chaplain, and the Middle East Center, run by Arabs, and a few days after I accepted, uh, the Slitka Center was totally f funded by Hillel, and Hillel said to them <clears throat> that anyone who came to speak who had publicly supported BDS or who belonged to an organization that did uh, would not be welcome, and their funding was going to be jeopardized by that. And I was really shocked, and I told them I thought it was disgusting. As it happened, I meet both criteria. I haven't, I on, on purpose, have kept my head down while I've written the book. Now all bets are off, but I haven't done any public anything because I just wanted to write my book in peace. But, you know, it's a, it was a loyalty test, and I found it, and I said, I found it very McCarthy-ish and disgusting that I was being asked that question. So that happened right away which my colleague Richard Locke said, oh, that's good, now you'll be armored for the next round when it comes, you won't be so shocked. Um, but um, I, I, I think the, the, the Times is very famous for not, for being, for tilting toward Israel and against Palestinians in a lot of its coverage. And I think the review that came out the same week that my book came out was a, a book by Barry Weiss, <coughs> Um, basically equating anti-Israel feeling with anti-Semitism, and the, it was a very sycophantic review. And I think my book po possibly won't be reviewed. Which, and I've always, my, I've never had a problem having reviews in the Times, so that's kind of been a shocker. Um, but so far, people have been very receptive, for the most part. I, I mean, not in, except for these two instances entirely. Um, I knew very well that there are incredibly high feelings around this, and I, you know, and I understand why they are, but I think a, a, some of it's based on misinformation, to tell you the truth, and I hope some of the things that I write about in the book shed some light on that subject. Some more questions on this side? Hi. Were there any books that, uh, or writers who inspired you as you were going through the process? Taha Muhammad Ali, who I quoted from at the end, I thought he's a beautiful poet, and there were t really too many books to mention. They just, if look at the bibliography, which has around, I don't know, a lot of books, a couple of hundred books. Those are the books. Um, yeah, I mean, um, a, a good friend of mine, Menachem Klein, was who's written a lot of books, uh, which I also qu quote from in, in the in the book, was particularly helpful and guided me through a lot of complicated issues and helped me. But the, and Yaron himself actually was incredibly his book, Rubber Bullets, was incredibly helpful. Um, David Shulman is a writer I admire very much. It, it's too long a list. But if you look at the bibliography, you'll, you'll see the people who I found most helpful. Yes? Hi, Liz. Uh, Hi. How you worked in writing and in editing to avoid the normalization of war and violence, especially when humor is included, that like, I worry too much that it may over-normalize the situation. How you worked around that? Um, 
well, let's put it this way. As my friends know, I had a stomach ache almost every day I was in Israel. <laughs> Literally, it, it was so. That I, I never felt that anything was being normalized. I have heard people go there and say, "Oh, it's so beautiful there," or you know, they go as tourists, and I, 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 that's unavailable to me in a certain way. Um, you know, there is a way in which you never adjust to these things if you're thinking about them all the time. But there's another way in which you're writing words on the paper, and it takes you away. From, in a way, the emotions, you have the emotions, but they're being trans, transferred to language and a kind of more global way of approaching them. So I, I, don't, I, nor, I would never use the word normalizing. I don't think anybody could read this and think that I thought that anything was normal because I didn't think anything was normal there practically, except family life. The sustaining core of these two families was their family life, which gave them nourishment when the outside world did not provide it all the time. And they had both of them very strong families. That's right. Yeah. Yes? So I have a comment. Uh, oh, sorry. I have a comment. So many times when um, a visitor comes into a country, they will tell you what collectively they think the story should be that you could you should hear right so i know that you had to work very hard to get the trust of those individuals to really for them to share the truth of their story with you um i grew up in northern ireland during the troubles and remember you knew kind of what to say to people um who were interested in in the stories so I can appreciate it that it would take very, a very long time to really get to that level of um, truth that they could trust you. And I know that had to be hard. It was hard. Yes. It was hard, especially yeah. with the Palestinians. Yes. Yeah, it was hard. Are we done? I think we're done. I think we're done. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much. Thank everybody. you, everybody, for Thank coming. You. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.